All right, new update for Machine, and this is probably one of the most exciting things I've seen added to Machine in a long time, and that is auto sampling. I'm such a huge fan of auto sampling that I've got an old video on how to do it using totally different software and load that into Machine. Now we don't need to do that. It's built right into the software itself. It means that Machine now has the ability to take synthesizers like this Polybrute or like the Moog Sub 25 or an old vintage synth and take that synthesizer capture the patches, save those patches on your computer, and then use them whenever you want. So you don't even need to own the synth, you could just borrow it or rent it, and then capture all of these great patches that you make yourself. So we're gonna look at the auto sampler today. We're gonna to talk about Machine Mark III and Machine Plus and whether I think you should buy one now because some of you are probably looking at the features and going, you know what, this is actually getting a little bit more enticing. And they are on sale right now. I have affiliate links in the description so you can help me out by buying through one of those links, but I don't want you buying a Machine or a Machine Plus if it's not right for you. So that's what my videos are all about. Finding out if this technology is something that's gonna benefit you and what you do in your studio. Lupop has a great video on the auto sampler and he even uses the Machine Plus version that's not out yet. So I'll put a link to that in the description because it's great to get somebody else's take on it. But I'm gonna walk you through some of the details of this and take you a little further into the sampling capabilities and what auto sampled patches are gonna look like for you because it's not always gonna be perfect and you're gonna have to do some tweaking. But a lot of people don't realize that you have this incredible multi-sample capability of machine built into what are called sounds. So if you buy an expansion, you can look and load up sounds that come with an expansion. There'll be a few of them in there, but what people don't realize is they are actually multi-sampled instruments in a, con a contact-like sampler, but it's just built in part of machine. So before I get into the auto sampler, I wanna talk about buying machine and whether you should buy a machine or machine plus right now. Now they are on sale, so they've gone down in price, which is good because they kind of got more expensive to buy one than they were when I first even bought a Machine Mark III several years ago. Is there something new coming? I don't have any insider information, but I don't see them coming out with a Mark IV anytime really soon because the Machine Plus is still relatively new. And I don't think they're gonna make this device obsolete just yet, they're still refining it. And there's a firmware coming very soon, which will give us the auto sampling capability on the Machine Plus itself. So I do feel like it's still a safe time to buy a Mark III. And the other thing is these devices hold their value really well. And that's because Native Instruments continues to support old hardware for a long time after the product becomes obsolete. The other thing that you can consider is that you don't necessarily need to buy a machine and use the software or the DAW part of machine uh, in the way that most people do use machine. You could use it as a controller. I've got a video where I recently set up the new MIDI remote script with Cubase and machine. So go check that out. So that really becomes a beautiful controller for Cubase. You could also use it now as an auto sampler for your sampler of choice. So if you have a piece of software like Cubase or Studio One or Ableton that doesn't have auto sampling capabilities, you can now use the auto sampling capabilities of machine, which are really nice and then import those samples into whatever sampler you want. So there's all sorts of other reasons to get a machine right now, but you really wanna make sure that those are the right reasons for you. The other question is about the Machine Plus. And just last week, I did my first performance with a little jazz combo with the Machine Plus. And I was just playing a kit that I had made and the band, the jazz band was playing along with that. And it was a ton of fun. But when I was working on the song with the band, I did have it crash on me. So it made me quite nervous to use it in a live scenario. So we'll see what happens with the new firmware. I didn't have a lot of stuff running on it and I did have a lot of reverbs. So I went and got rid of all those reverbs, set it up as send effects, which I've got videos on how to do uh, in the past where I talk about optimizing Machine Plus. So I had to go and do that personally for my own little project. And then I had no problems with crashes and it worked flawlessly in the performance. But made me a little nervous, you know. I had an MP3 backup just in case this thing did crash on me in the performance, but it worked out really well. Anyways, who is the Machine Plus really for? It's definitely for the person who just wants to break free from the computer. So let's have a look at the auto sampler now and see what it is capable of. So I've been using the Polybrute last few days just to do some auto sampling. It's not multi-timbral. So that means you can only have one patch on it at a time. It's polyphonic, so you can have multiple notes. And 
with something like this Moog Sub 25 here, this is where the auto sampler gets really exciting because you can make a patch and then sample one note at a time. And then once you get it on the machine, you now have a polyphonic patch if you want. So for sound designers, this is a really great way to archive your patches and make your own libraries of sounds. And I think a lot of people are gonna really benefit from that. Who else is gonna really benefit from auto sampling? Of course, anybody who's using the Machine Plus because you can't take virtual instruments with you. So something like Omnisphere, one of my favorite virtual instruments. You sample your favorite patches on Omnisphere and then turn them into patches that load on your Machine Plus. You can take it anywhere. The sampler in Machine that's built in is actually quite powerful. And it's the zone button where you're going to be accessing all of this information that is being picked up or created by the auto sampler. Let's get into the zone for a sec. You can see things like we've got the notes from left to right and then velocity from top to bottom. So up at the very top is a sample that's going to be triggered if we play this pad at 127 velocity. And then if you've got a sample that's way down here at the bottom, this one is only going to be triggered by a really soft velocity. And so then you would want to have other samples stacked up on top of this or have this note just stretched over the whole thing. So no matter what velocity you play, it's going to play that sample. So the first thing I'm going to do is just make a patch for you right here. So I'm going to click the sampling button, which is the same thing as clicking this little button on the software right here. And then down at the bottom, we have to choose mode auto. So this is where the auto sampler is. And on the hardware, it's just right here. So we go to auto, that's our auto sampler. First thing we've got is the sample length and the note on length. What this means here is how long is the note actually going to be played for? And then how long do you want the sample to be in total? So this is including the two seconds of the note, and then you'll have basically a three second decay. So it's kind of like going like this. One, two, three, four, five. And you hear that's not quite long enough. So I'm going to set my note on message to be three seconds, which you have to do 3000, by the way. And then the sample itself, I want to make this three seconds longer than the note on. So actually, let's make it a little bit longer than that. Let's make it 7,000 milliseconds, seven seconds. And then I've got my source set, which is my external stereo going into my audio interface. We've got to choose where the MIDI is going, which is going to go to our Polybrute. We've got it set to channel one. And then the next thing we've got is stride. How often are you going to take a sample? Is it every note? So if it's one, that means you're going to do C, you're going to do C sharp, you're going to do D, D sharp, E, and so on. And right now it won't let me put in a stride anything longer than one. And that's because our low note and our high note are the same thing. Let's take this low note to C2 and we're going to extend it up to C5. And then we've got this thing called extend. And what extend does is after you've done all of your sampling, we can look at this patch right here. If I click on zone. So what extend is, is it takes the sample to the left on the bottom and it takes the sample to the right. So all it's doing is multi samples in the middle from the zone you choose. And then it extends that sample all the way down. So at C1 here, we can hear our sample. Now, if I go down an octave, all it's doing is pitching that one sample, this one sample all the way down. So that's what extend does. It goes all the way down the bottom of your keyboard. And then at the top, it takes that sample and extends it all the way up. So it's kind of like the samples you don't really care about, but at least you still have it. So things could get really funky in terms of LFOs and stuff like that, because it's just taking the sample and making it play back faster. And then velocity map is going to be a similar sort of thing. We've got stride, which is how often, how many velocity values are you taking a sample? So right now, if it's set to 100 and 100, that means we're only going to take one sample and we're going to end up with a map that looks just like this. One sample that's stretched from top to bottom. And top to bottom in this case refers to low velocity all the way up to the highest velocity, which is 127. So we've got 127 possible states. That's what this stride value uh, gives us potentials. If you put the velocity low to 0 to 127 and then put stride to 127, this, don't ever do this by the way, it's going to take 128 actual samples of one note. So you're going to be sitting there for about a day until this 
patch gets made, right? So don't do that. We don't want to sample every one value of velocity. That's just ridiculous. You might want very few, and you can decide where does that start. And some patches, if you play them, nothing really changes when, when you have a soft velocity or a loud velocity, and it just depends on the patch. And maybe you just decide, I just want it to be at full velocity. So set it to 127, set this one to 127, and your stride to one. Now you're just going to get one sample at full velocity. This is basically like saying, how hard do you want the finger to play the note when it's being auto sampled or the robot to play the finger, if you want to think of it that way, right? If I were to set my velocity low to something like 65 and my velocity high to 65, then now I'm only going to get one sample at 65 velocity. So it'll be a softer play of that note that's being captured. In most situations, if it has some kind of velocity information, you're probably going to want to do something like set the low velocity as the softest note that you're going to play is going to be maybe, let's say, 70. And the highest velocity that you're going to play is going to be, let's say, 128. So what happens if you get all the way up there? And then, or 127 in this case. So if I set my stride to something like 10, it's going to take a sample at 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, and probably at 127 as well. So we're going to get seven samples recorded at different velocities, at those different velocity levels. And they're going to be mapped out on our zone. So let's just see what happens if we do that. I'm going to hit start. And this is still going to take 14 times 7 seconds. So I'll just fast forward this. So because I had extend on, it did one sample at C3, and then stretched that all the way to the left, to the bottom. And then we did one set of samples at C sharp and stretch those all the way to the top. We also had extend on on velocity. So it did a sample at 70, which is right about here, and then it stretched it down all the way to the bottom. So that's what extend does when you're dealing with velocity, which makes sense because if you played it really soft, you wouldn't want it to trigger nothing. Because if I did that, watch what happens if I take this zone and make it stop at, what is that, 70. Nothing's going to happen if I play below 70 on the velocity. It's not until I play harder that we're going to trigger any of these samples. So yeah, you definitely want the extend on always when you're dealing with velocity. And what else did we get? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We got seven different samples recorded with those velocity settings from 70 to 127 with a stride of 10. This stride number was a little strange for me at first, but I think hopefully that clears up exactly what's happening with stride there. And then we've got batch process. And in batch process, we've got find loop. I'm going to go to loop. I'm going to turn that on and show you what loop looks like if you were to set it manually yourself. So loop on. Let's set the start of the loop to something right here. Let's go to the end of the loop and put it something like this. And then release the note and it keeps going inside the loop. It doesn't jump to the end, which would be beautiful if we could have that feature in here, because then we could actually get the tail reverb of something like the polybrute, which we can't do at this point. What do you get in this case? Well, in this case, what it does is it's going to use an, an amplitude envelope just to end the note. So you get to choose how much of this plays when you release the note. And to change that, before we get into anything more with this, the sample, so we want to go up to the plugin button up here in the software or the plugin button on the hardware. And if you're on the plugin button right here and you're on the sound level, you can see things like voice settings, engine, pitch, envelope. So this is the envelope we want to find to determine what happens when we stop playing the note. So here, if we play with the attack, decay, sustain, release, that's how quickly does the note kick in, how quickly does it get to the sustain level, and how loud is the sustain level. Well, in this case, decay doesn't do anything because the sustain level is at full uh, volume. Now with the release, we want to say, okay, what happens when you re release the note? You release the note and it, it gives you 217 milliseconds of this sound. That's why we're not hearing the end of the tail end of this note. We're just going to hear 217 more milliseconds of this sound as it's looping through this thing. So when I release the note, 
we can see that it keeps going a tiny little bit longer and then it stops the note. What happens if we go to the plugin and go to the release and crank that up to something like four or five seconds? Now I'm at five seconds and watch what happens when I play the note. It's still going through the loop. So this is just one thing to keep in mind about the sampler in machine that's built in. In other samplers, you would have the ability to, when you release the note, to jump to the actual release tail of the note at some specific part. We can't do that, of course, here, but we can still approximate what you would get with something like the Polybrute with its reverb or its delay by putting our own reverb and delay on our patch that we make here in machine. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a second as well. So I hold the note down and it's glitching. It's not sounding very nice. So we need to work with our loop a little bit and it could be partially where I found those spots and machine with this new auto sampler has it built in where it can analyze and put a loop at an optimized spot, which is great. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So you're gonna have to know how to tweak that and it's not always super easy. So that's the kind of the, the downside of this. So we clearly need to put a crossfade between these two loop points. So I'm gonna crank up the crossfade here. You can hear it kind of dropping down. This patch is a perfect example of a loop that's not working very well, right? And that's because of the patch itself, the note itself is changing so much in this few seconds that no matter what I do, I can't get back to the beginning of that sound in the loop without it sounding like it's really changing. And in this case, what I'd probably want to do is capture a longer sample. So you're, you're just going to have to change things with this auto sampler for each patch. It's not like you can set your settings in the auto sampler and just do that for every single sound because you're going to have different things that you want to capture with different patches. So if I go over to a different, a totally different patch that I've captured already, let's try this one. This is an example of a loop that is working perfectly. You cannot hear that loop. I didn't use the crossfade on that. So this was just the built-in auto sampler choice of the loop and it worked perfectly. So for my first few patches, I was like, oh dang, this is working really well. Let's look at this patch right here. So it's a very pulsy kind of sound and the auto sampler, the machine auto sampler did a perfect loop detection basically and put the start and end of our loop at peaks so that as it loops it just keeps that cycle going and the rhythm of it is even perfect and then when i let go so the auto sampler's built-in loop detection works really well sometimes and not as well other times in this case the problem was this patch just kind of changed a little too much over time so there really isn't a great spot to find a good loop so what i would probably do again is just go and resample this and do it with a longer detection so maybe like five or six seconds so that i could get a really long chunk of this note and then maybe in that point if i wanted to loop it or just do it at a six second thing and make sure anytime i play that synthesizer i'm not holding notes for longer than six seconds because then it's not really an issue so you got to think about these things when you're setting up your loops and stuff like that so other caveats that i need to mention are the fact that you cannot edit loop points on all of these samples at the same time the other thing i'd love to have on here is an automatic fade on the end of each of these samples as it is right now, if I want to put a fade at the end of one of these notes, I would have to go over to edit and then choose with the selection range, something like this. And then I would say, I would go over to fade out right here and hit apply. Now there's gonna be a perfect fade out at the end of the sample, but you're gonna have to do that on a whole bunch of samples potentially. So there's a lot in here that could get very time consuming. I don't need to worry about fade outs for the most part because this loop kind of negates the need for the end of a sample. Okay, so let's take this patch right here. Let's try something else. I want to record every note with the reverb and I want it to be a really short note. So we're gonna capture a sample that is, 
Instead, of, we're going to go 750 milliseconds. And then we're going to make the sample itself 3,500 milliseconds. Let's make this just a short one, just so it doesn't take forever. So we'll set that to C3 to C4. And then we're going to set our velocity to 127 and our stride to 1. And we're going to extend that so it goes all the way up and down, or all the way down, I guess. We're not going to find a loop. And then we're going to trim silence. We're going to turn that on and normalize. If you have normalize on, it's going to crank up the volume of all of the samples to full volume. So if you're playing something that has some dynamics, and at first it plays the soft one and it samples that, and then it plays the loud one and it samples that, those are both going to get pushed up to the exact same level. So you're going to lose some of that velocity information in terms of volume. I also wonder if it's smart to record a sample, have like say a pad that's at full volume, and then you play a chord with that, you're probably going to start to get some distortion. I don't know, let me know what you think in the comments. But to me, it seems like we're going to have too much kind of frequency overlap and too much volume potentially in one single patch. So I'd kind of be inclined to check your level of your patch on your audio interface. Check it on the machine as well. You can see it right here. And I think if it's getting too close to the top, I think you're going to have too much build up anyways if you go and start playing some chords. So having some headroom, I think, is probably a really smart thing in these patches anyways. So you don't want it to be too quiet, but we also don't want it to be too close to the top. So that's the normalized function. I'd probably just leave that off from now on for myself. Let's try capturing this one now. OK, so there's our patch. So let's see what we got. Now, in this case, I can see my sample. And it just stops when I let it go. Now, this is where we go over to plugin button. Or we look up at the plugin button right here for this sound. And again, we look at page two, which is pitch envelope. Or we click the plugin button and go over to page two. And right here on type, we've got it set to ADSR, which is what I was talking about earlier with the loop. I hold it down, it plays the note. It's great. When I let it go, it uses this release value. If I crank up the release value, it continues to play that sample for 1.2 seconds after I let it go, or 2.9 seconds after I let it go. That's the release. But we can also change this from type ADSR to type one shot. And if I go to one shot, now it's just going to play that whole sample no matter how long I hold this note down. So now, no matter how, how long I hold the notes for, it's just going to play the whole sample. So that is using one shot versus ADSR. So again, if you need to go and edit these samples, the way you're going to need to do it is click on your sample, click on Edit, and then now you can go in and start doing things like uh, a fade out, if you need a, 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 a faster fade out, or if you want to trim stuff, that's where you're going to use these functions. And I have lots of videos on sampling and go into a lot of detail on what you can do with these. So I'll have some links to some of my sampling videos. So one more thing to mention. You've just created a patch. Let's say this bow and arrow one. I've created this patch. I've chosen the release value so that when I let go, we get a nice release of the note. If I want that a little bit longer, I just crank that up. And I want to save this as a patch that I can now use on, say, Machine Plus. I can transfer it onto my Machine Plus, or I can send it to a friend who wants to use that patch, or I want to put it in my own little library of patches. I can right click on this patch, and I can go Save, and I can choose where I want to save it. I can also save it with the samples, because right now the sample is kind of locked into this project, not into this sound. Uh, patch. And that's the other thing to keep in mind is that when you go and save this, it's going to save it as a sound. So if I go to browser, we are not going to look for it under groups. We're going to look for it under the sounds menu. And the sounds in machine are a special kind of file. So if I look at a patch that I just made here on the computer, I've got my bow and arrow patch, a .mxsnd patch. And then in that folder, I've got the sample. So all of these little samples that I just created. So the thing to keep in mind is that you can also save this patch with effects on it. So if I like that patch, but I loved how when it was on Polybrute, it had some reverb, I can go to the sound menu on this sampler, 
click the plus button and choose a reverb. So let's go to uh, MetaVerb. You can do all sorts of stuff. You can have a huge chain of effects on here. Let's change the size of this room. Let's put a limiter on there, get it nice and loud. We could put, let's go to Resochord. I love Resochord. Let's put a flanger on there. And then you could also put an LFO. Let's put a syncable LFO on that. Maybe change the speed. So you can see how much stuff I can save with this sound feature. Now I take my bow and arrow patch with all of its effects, right click on that, save with samples, save that on my computer. And then now I'm going to make a new group over here and then I'm going to go to my files, double click on that. And now of course we can see all of the effects all of the effects that we just added to it, as well as all of my sampler information. So this is how you can now make some really complex patches out of samples, add some more effects to them, and then save that as a sound patch. So it is possible to make these multi-sampled patches on machine, which I think a lot of people don't realize that this is an incredibly powerful feature and takes machine into a whole other territory. And I'm just super excited about it. So glad they finally put that on machine itself. So thanks Native Instruments. Can't wait to see what you guys do next. How about custom chords? Can we get a custom chord set capability? I want to make custom chord sets for my followers because I think you guys would probably appreciate that, wouldn't you? Anyways, let me know what you think about all this in the, in the comments. Hit the subscribe button and the bell and all that, and we'll see you in the next video.